you're the expert in this in when it comes to the audio and all the things i don't know a single thing about it um i've got i've got friends who are editors for audiobooks and things and they're always going on about complete nonsense that i don't understand <laughs> I know that there are peaks and troughs. Don't know what that means, but like, <laughs> I couldn't tell you how loud a decibel is. But they, you know, I've I've never had an, this thing. I'm not an expert on it, but if I listen to it and think, yeah, this sounds great, you know, it sounds like other audio books, then I just assume it's good, and okay. we seem to agree. Jack closed his menu with a despondent sigh. He was certain that he was going to get those experience points soon. It was almost inevitable that he was going to get into a fight with something. He wasn't naive enough to think otherwise. He put his hands behind his head and closed his eyes. Beneath him, he could still hear the pirates joking and laughing. But after all the pain and suffering he'd been through recently, their happiness was comforting. When he woke in the morning, he was going to send them back to the mine. It might not be escaping on the ship. Being zapped back to the tower was a way out of the hellscape they found themselves in. Tracy Gregory, how are things in Cardiff? Uh, good. Weather's turned a little bit, but we'll be all right, I think. Why, what's it doing? It's, I suppose uh, it wouldn't It wouldn't be Wales if it wasn't wet, would it? wouldn't keep it all beautiful uh, and green we, if you didn't have the rain. We do all right. It's not as bad as people think. But Great. no, it's raining at the moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Do you have Both to... raining and someone's firing off fireworks, so they're giving it a go. Uh, I'm not sure how that'll pan out for them. <laughs> okay, well, don't don't make the mistake I made over fireworks. Mm. I was on the air at BRMB Radio in Birmingham many years ago, which, as you know, Birmingham multicultural melting pot has yeah. been for a long, long time. And weeks before bonfire night, I was sitting in on the breakfast show, which meant I had to get up at four o'clock. The bref- uh, Les Ross, the breakfast presenter, was off for a few weeks. It meant I had to get up at 4 a.m. to be able to be at the radio station in time and all the rest of it. Anyway, the night before my first breakfast show on the biggest radio station I'd ever worked at at that stage, Birmingham, second biggest market in the UK, someone was letting off fireworks. So one of the first things I did when I got on the air was just to have a go at them and say, you know, it's right. not even bonfire night for weeks yet. For goodness sake, can you just give it a rest? What's the matter with you people? We have one night a year. I don't mind that. But why does it have to be days and days before whatever? Turns out it was Diwali, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so be careful. If someone lets fireworks off now, it might be kids just going early. Then again, it could have big cultural significance. You don't want to put your foot in it. Yeah. Bit of advice there. Okay. So when you and I first worked together, because this is the fifth, Wake the Dead is the fifth book we've done together as an audio book. Yeah. When we first worked together, you still had a day job. I did, yes. Yeah. How long have you been a professional author now? Uh seven eight months at this point yeah 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 Yeah. and are you enjoying the author lifestyle uh yeah it's 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 much the same you know i make myself still get up and go to work in the same kind of hours you would do normally otherwise i think as soon as you start not doing that nothing gets done at that point (laughs) so you've still got to keep a routine and get up and do all that yeah otherwise it wouldn't work i don't think yeah, I mean, I'm still getting, I'm two years into being full-time audiobooks because uh, before that I was um, I, I was a radio presenter and so I'm still getting used to, to that. I find I work like twice as many hours as I did in radio because the commute is basically from that bedroom to this bedroom. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. it's just always there. Yeah, so it, it, it's about it's about discipline and sometimes just saying no. There's a football match on TV tonight. I'm stopping at six o'clock and I'm going to. Well, yeah, that's so, exactly the point. It's part of it is trying to keep the or oh, start at nine, maybe finish at like five, but make sure you finish because otherwise you'll just keep going and you'll end up <laughs> not wasting your life. It's working. You end up working more than you would do otherwise. Yeah, I mean, temptation's always there. You've got to be careful, haven't you? Otherwise, it's. It's not great. Wife's not impressed if you're working and you said you'd exactly. be done. So. Yeah, because yeah. they don't think it's work anyway. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. And, no. And so do you have, because um, a lot of writers say one of the hardest parts is getting started. And I heard of a writer who, and maybe lots of writers do this, 
Before they finish for the end of the day, they'll start like the next chapter and like stop in the middle of a sentence. So that when they get up the next morning, they, they don't have to get started. They just carry on that set. That it's basically they've already started. Uh, do you do that or have a trick not, to get you going or do you have problems getting started? Not not really. Um, sometimes that'll be the case. There'll be something part written, but that's not intentionally. It'll just be, oh, I've you know finished what in the chapter I wanted to do with the day, but actually I've still got an hour or so left. So then I will just keep going. But a lot of, if I've got like a blank, so a lot of people look at the blank page and they get kind of afraid of it almost like, oh, there's a lot. How do I start? Yeah. I've never had that. <laughs> I can just yeah sit down and start doing it. It takes a little more takes a ramp up your start and you'll be slow at the start and you kind of the number of words you're doing per hour is particularly high and it'll get more and more and more and more and more and more yeah as the day comes on and then you get lunch and then you find you're back to square one and you have to start again it's like, right. a, it's like a rhythm that builds up you know but getting started never really been a problem for me and do you have a set number of words that you have to do per day to, to, to um did you, you set yourself a goal I try and I try and get a chapter done per day, but exactly how long a chapter is varies a little bit. Your, yours are very consistent, though. You know, I mean, I tend worked, to be. Yeah, yeah. I, I've I've worked with a lot of authors where you might get you because know, I'm working in you're working in words. I'm working in minutes, yeah. um, and and you know, I, I work with authors where one chapter could be seven minutes long and the next one could be like thirty-seven minutes long. But yours are always around about. The twenty-five minute mark, maybe sometimes a little bit longer, sometimes a bit shorter. But yours are very consistent. I, I think that's that's probably down to the fact that I do try and do a chapter a day. So it tends to be I'm working on a chapter for the same length of time each day. So I think that's probably why it it ends up like that. Um, but yeah, some are a bit shorter, some are a bit longer. But yeah, that's probably why. Uh, and do you work weekends? Again. No, no. You, you actually take again, the weekends off. Good I, for I you. I do because again, I think if you don't, if you start not doing that. It's very difficult to break out of that habit. Yeah. You know, yeah. The, my the, issue the, is that Julie works in retail, so she often works weekends, which means if she's not here, I think, oh, I might as well just go in the booth and carry on. <laughs> you know, if she's not here, what am I going to set up on my own? You know what I mean? So, yeah, I, I know what you mean. Yeah. It, it, you, if you've got a structure where you've got definitely got a week, I often don't know what day it is. Uh, I get that. Yeah. It's something. <laughs> Unfortunately, the downside of doing this kind of thing is you don't you don't interact with like we work in an office job. You interact with all the people in the office, even if it's working from home. You interact with them like digitally. Other what we do is just us sign yes. a chair on your own most of the day. So you, you do lose track of days. I think sometimes I do I do get you there. Yeah, I have to say, I mean, I like to, I like to think I have a writer's lifestyle. Obviously, without the pressure of having to create <laughs> from scratch, all the stuff I do, somebody's already, someone like you has already created it, and I just read it, read it out, uh, and uh, and basically steal the glory of of, <laughs> of what of your work for for the audiobook. So I'm very, but I've got the lifestyle of a writer, and I do love it. I do love like going like, oh, I'm a bit sleepy. Oh, I'm gonna have an hour, and I just have a sleep, or I go like. Do you know what? I'm just going stir crazy in here. I'm going to walk up to the shops. We're not going to go to those shops. I'm going to go to the shops a bit further on. You know, just, um, yeah, I, I just like the freedom of that. Whereas, you know, before radio, when I was an air conditioning engineer, it was a 8.30 to 5.30 job. And uh, in radio, it was based on whatever the air shift was. And you mm -hmm. had to be at a certain point at a certain time to be in the studio because when the light goes on, you better be there. But this, this, this is, to me, this the lifestyle... The, the author lifestyle agrees with me. I like it. And uh, I'm glad it's worked out for you because the books are terrific. And let's talk about the latest audio book, Wake the Dead. Would this be considered a spin-off from the Goblin Summoner series that we've already done? Uh, yeah, I, I suppose so. Yeah, yeah. That's that the kind of the, well, not the intent of it, but kind of how it, it ended up being. It was always, like initially it was part, part of one of the previous novels but it kind of in interrupted the flow it, novels always had elements of going to different points of views on certain occasions and seeing different things but it interrupted with the flow of the past couple novels a little bit too much and so it made more sense to take it out flesh it out into its own its own book and we get to see maybe a part of the the world and the setting that the the main characters and their plot line is kind of left behind almost. yes yes they've, they've moved on with doing what they're doing but there's this whole situation that's left unresolved that will 
what happens to that? What's in the ci- in this like devastated city, yeah, yeah, they've exactly. moved, they've escaped. In the main characters, for anyone who hasn't read the books yet or listened to them, the, the main characters they go off to to another place and escape the the the, the absolute catastrophe that that strikes this city, and, and so now you've got a character, you've got Jack, uh, dealing with going back to that city and looking for someone that's that's missing that he wants to find and meeting some other characters. It was interesting that you chose Jack because when you first wrote Jack, was it book two or book, book three that Jack appears first time? Uh, he's in book one. Very Is he? Brief. Yeah, Is he? yeah, yeah. He's literally... When they first when they first go to Wildermount the city, these yeah. he's literally the bandit that they meet along that, the road. Yeah, he's a baddie. He's a yeah. baddie. Oh, that was all the way in book one, was it? That was book when they one. have the tournament yeah. in the pub. Yeah, uh, that's oh. two. Yeah, so book one is the he appears as the bandit, and then in book oh, two. Oh, the... see, to me, it's all just it's a continuous story. So one I don't. I'm, I'm, I'm having yeah. problems working out where one book ends and the next one's. Out. Oh, because that was the thing that struck me when I did this one. I thought, okay, wake the dead. Okay, Goblin Summoner series. Okay, RPG. Here we go. Oh, it's Jack. With well, Jack started out as a baddie, as an enemy yeah. of of um, Gareth and, and and the rest of them. So I see. So why? So was it a did you did you choose him for the spin-off or was this a fact that you just worked out there's a story here to be told and I can tell it through him better? I think it's just kind of the the logical progression of him as a character. He's right, he starts out as a bandit, and then in the second book he's almost fallen into being a kind of vigilante folk hero because yeah. he's just robbing other criminals, but people tend to ascribe to him then always well, actually he's he's helping people and that was never his intent, but he kind of evolves into that. And then this is kind of the, the ultimate culmination when, you no, know, he is going back to try and help people now. That is what he's become. He's fallen into being this hero and think, well, actually, I kind of, maybe I do need to live up to this a little bit. Maybe I do need to try and use his, his skills and abilities to, do, you know, do what's right. Like in this case, look for a lost friend, but he gets involved in what's going on in the city and, and so on. Yeah, it is. It is great that the character developed that way from from being just a bad guy and a bandit, and now he's got this all these redeeming features. But they were in his character all along, but they never came to the yeah, fore because just for survival, he was a bandit. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah he was never a particularly good bandit. But yes, <laughs> no. yeah. Well, it's yeah. more part of the book. It's definitely the elements of the way that the way that the city is structured, isn't it? Where it's the all the rich people live at the top, all the poor people live at the bottom, because it's different layers up a mountain, isn't it? And he's essentially lived in poverty all his life. And that's what happens. People live in poverty. They too turn to banditry or whatever they need to do to survive. So it's more, never he was like never a, a bad person, so to speak, but that was just how he had to live because of his, his circumstances. And now obviously those have changed and what, what this means for him going forward. Because that's the... That's the initial impetus of the first book, isn't it? It's all these people who don't have power. They don't have decks. They don't have cards. They don't have access to magic because they're just commoners. Suddenly do, almost yeah. as a side effect of what happens to the main characters. So yeah. the kind of entire power structure of the, the kingdom is completely upended overnight, essentially. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's kind of what the, people, what the regular people do when they're given that kind of gift that most people never see. You know, yeah, and how does society you... cope with that too? Yeah, yeah, it's the same as if you turn around and took away, you know, billionaires' money and you gave it to a random person on the street. What are they going to do with that? You don't, you don't know. You don't know if they're going to hopefully do good things with it. They may, they may not. You know, it's it's the same idea of what becomes of a society when everybody is given access to its resources to an extent. You know, yeah. It's... I mean, Tall Terry definitely goes bad, doesn't he? Because you he's do. got that. Get... It's an abuse of power with him. Is is yeah, exactly. You know, he's, he's the baddie exactly, in yeah. this one. Yeah, yeah. He's he's kind of the other route that Jack could have taken. That's yes. Almost the intent. He could have easily gone that way instead of the way that he does. Does it? Yeah. Helps yeah. Tall Terry's probably insane. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Yeah. No. Uh, unquestionably, he's a sociopath. He's probably a psychopath. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think probably I think with specifically what happens, as I said, the calamity that befalls the city, I think it would be very difficult to remain entirely sane in that kind of circumstance. <laughs> yeah, 
Oh, it's a terrific book. I loved it just as much as all the others, you know. I really did. And I, I really do enjoy it when you when you when you contact me and you say, Oh, there's another one to do, and I go, Oh great, what are they gonna do? What's he gonna throw at them this time? And uh Will the other characters get their own books, do you think? Uh, maybe. I, I do like the idea of occasionally doing these kind of books where you see almost the what's left in the wake of the main characters as they go on their heroic quests. Because you've always got this idea in fantasy, people, this big quest, they're trying to save the world or the universe or whatever it might be, and they, they go to different places and they, they do X, they do Y. But there's always going to be people left behind afterwards. Right? Yeah. They've yeah. got to pick up the pieces from... These heroes come into town, they beat a bunch of orcs or whatever, but and then they leave off for another country. But what does that mean next week? You know, all the orcs are gone. Does that mean a bunch of ogres are going to move in and it's going to be worse? Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. I like the idea of maybe kind of exploring after the after the fact and seeing kind of what ripples outwards from their actions. I think it's quite a, a fun yeah. idea to play with. Yeah, yeah. I like the way that with, through all the books. There are subtle messages in there about good things. I mean, you know, you can see that um, that that Jack does kind of see that he has to do better because he's being he's being written about uh, as a good person, and he's not sure whether he's matching up to that. And there's there's something yeah. in that about society, but there's there's a, there's just small things in there like. In, in I'm going back to the other goblin summoner books now, but uh, with the spiders, when they first encounter them, they treat them as monsters. But then when they work out how to communicate with them and understand them and understand with each other, then all those barriers and all those walls fall down. And there's just something about, you know, you know, something in, in our world like racism it is based on ignorance. But when you understand and can communicate, then all the all the fear and the barriers and everything come down. Do, do you deliberately put those messages in there or does that just come out? Uh, a, a little bit. Like I don't, I would never want to be in someone's face about something particular, <laughs> yeah. but yeah. whatever you're writing, whatever your, your kind of personal opinions are and things like that, they're always going to work their way into the, into the text. Do you know what I mean? That's just, that's just how writing works, you know? Yeah. And you're right. I think kind of the core, core through line, of kind of the whole goblin something is whilst there are occasionally people who are bad actors, bad apples, the vast majority of people, you know, whether they be spiders or people or goblins, whether they are generally good on a baseline level, most people want to do the right thing. They want to help other people. They want to, I agree with you. Yeah. So I, I want to kind agree of explore that, that. No, that is a lot of fantasy fiction can get very, very dark. And certainly there are dark elements in these books, you know, especially wake the dead and things like that. Yeah. But there's always going to be the, but actually if we, we did this even if we were together you could put it right you know that's that's kind of the the whole gist of the the series almost is that you know things needed to be done there will be people who will try at least they might not succeed but they'll try you know yeah yeah and will there be more goblin summoner books or are uh, they yeah. going to be spin yeah. oh yeah, yeah there'll yeah, be yeah. number five so uh it, number five's nearly finished <laughs> that'll be yeah uh, great that'll be ready in a couple of weeks actually so yeah yeah, excellent. And how do you find the process of turning your work into an audio book? They're great. You know, it's it's always interesting to to see the text that you've written and, and then kind of performed by somebody else. Do you know what I mean? Because it, it is it, it's almost it is a transformative thing. You know, it, it's you've created this this piece of art. You know, you know, whatever that might be a novel or even like a nonfiction book or whatever it is. And you've handed it over to somebody else to then create, essentially, it's a related but still separate piece of art, right? Because there's a performance element to an audiobook that isn't there in a regular book. And it's just always interesting to see that kind of evolve and pan out and become what it is. You know, You're it's... great to work with, though. You just leave me to it. I mean, oh, yeah. well, I don't <laughs> think I've had a single note from you in five books and which used to freak me out at the beginning. I'm thinking, does he really like this? I don't hear from him. Oh, well, I'll turn it in and see what he says. And it, all, it always seems to work out. It's it's, well, it's fun to yeah, do. Yeah, this is the thing. When it comes to this, like, you're the expert in this. And when it comes to the audio and all the things, I don't know a single thing about it. Um, I've got I've got friends who are editors for audiobooks and things, and they're always going on about complete nonsense that I don't understand. <laughs> I know that there are peaks and troughs. Don't know what that means, but like, <laughs> okay. 
couldn't tell you how loud a decibel is, but they, you know, I've I've never had an, this thing. I'm not an expert on it, but if I listen to it and think, yeah, this sounds great, you know, it sounds like other audio books. Then I just assume it's good, <laughs> and people okay. seem to agree. People seem to agree. You know? <laughs> well, you know, when I look at the the charts on Audible of the bestsellers, and I only I only get at the numbers on I've done a 142 audio books up to this point, and only 40 of them are the deal that you and I have, where we I don't want to get too much into it, or you know, it, it's uh, but instead of instead of you paying me, I get a share of of yeah. the sales. So I can uh, there's only and on those 40, I can track exactly how many sell. The other hundred books, I I've no idea because they're out there in the ether. But of the ones I do that way, of the 40 books I've done with that deal, yours are the highest sellers uh, of the ones I've done. Mm -hmm. And when I look at those charts, it seems that most of the sales are in the USA. Yes, yeah. Why do you think that is? Uh, I, I think it's partly because the specific genre just hasn't caught on over here yet, I think. Really? Yeah, yeah, it's a genre that kind of gained popularity weirdly in Russia <laughs> originally. And the first kind of books that came over were like um, kind of Russian translations into English, which came out in the States. There's right. a whole like um, very similar genre in Japan, and they're done in Japanese, and they get they're infinitely more popular than the Western versions. They get TV adaptations and stuff. Yeah. Um, but that's considered a whole because the style and the way it's delivered is completely different. Um, yeah. even though you get elements of that leaking over here. If you ever see a novel with a ridiculous name, it's because they're trying to ape like the Japanese side of the genre. Things right. like, oh, Born in Another World as a wheelbarrow or something daft like that. Like, you'll notice some when you go out there. That's because that's why they're doing it. Um, but it kind of, Russian translations where it first picked up, they picked up in the States. And I just don't think it, there's obviously British people who buy it, but it's just not a bigger thing over here yet. Cause it's still a relatively new kind of subgenre. Uh, it's only been around for a couple of years. So the lit it, RPG. Is, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are books that you could say were kind of proto lit RPGs that have existed for for decades. You know, yeah. when when Dungeons and Dragons came out in you know seventy nine or whatever it was, like by by like eighty two came around, there were people writing novels about people who were pulled into their Dungeons and Dragons games with the stats and numbers, but the name didn't exist for the genre, and it was you know one in a blue moon that maybe didn't do particularly well nobody had over now it's grown into a, a much bigger thing mm -hmm. very very passionate um fan base you know they're very they're very voracious readers they will read everything that you put out which is great for an author mm -hmm. you know it's but it is it is a predominantly like american driven market at the moment. but for you to have of of all the royalty share books i've done which is 40 on that side for you to have i mean they sell in their thousands I and mean, these are big numbers for you to have the sales that you do, there must be something marketing-wise that, you know, if there's any other authors watching this, because I've done royalty share books with authors and they've been good books and they've been good authors, but they haven't sold in anywhere near the numbers that the Goblin Summoner books do. Is there a secret source in your marketing and are you willing to share? I, I don't, This is the thing. I don't think there's any one secret to being a successful author otherwise everybody would be doing it right it, well they've got to be able to write good books with good stories oh, yeah. and good characters i mean which it, they are they are very good books but i'm saying i mean your your books are excellent books but i've worked on other good books that haven't sold in anywhere near the numbers and it must come down to marketing mustn't it in the end? A, a lot of it is experience like i've been doing writing books for oh, it's got to be coming on four years now i've published i mean i've said written for as long as I could hold a pen, like, but in terms of publishing books, going on four years and so now, and it takes a lot of time, I think, to a kind of build up kind of a back catalog, and to be kind of know what is you have to kind of know what people want in advance of them actually wanting it. That makes sense. So you see like, you'll see a lot of discourse online and um, about between authors and they'll, they call it a thing called writing to market. And what they mean is looking at what's popular right. and writing a book in what's popular. That yeah. doesn't, doesn't work in that way. Um, kind of the watch just writing a book because it's a popular genre. People know instantly. 
uh, especially in something lip RPG. If you just write a book and you decide to add some numbers on it because you want it to be a lit RPG, people can tell right. straight away and they will right. crucify you for it. They're right. not that. Right. But it's about knowing that like, okay, well, I want to do you know, a lit RPG story, but how can I make it unique and give people something they didn't necessarily know they wanted? But when you your first books and things that come out of that, they're not going to sell well because you no one knows who you are. Right. You know, you're, you're a tiny nobody. And then once you release more books and more books and more books, you, you build up a fan base. And yeah. the truth of it is, like, most books, as you know, it's ACX, we do it goes on Audible, right? Yes. Because ACX, the, we work through ACX, which is owned by Audio Audible, which is owned by Amazon. Amazon. So we're dealing yeah, with the and, biggest distributors on the planet. Yeah. Well, the, the, thing, with, the thing with Amazon sales is it's, it's ultimately all algorithmically driven like everything is nowadays if it's when you go on amazon and you click on the book and it's like these are the other books you might like and in its algorithm it's got two books it might put in that slot on that web page and it's got one book that sold 100 copies and one book that sold two copies amazon's always going to pick the book that sold 100 copies to show to people because they know it sells yes they've seen more sales on it therefore in their mind it sells more and so they'll offer it up for people to buy and that's a snowball effect because then people don't buy that one, the the low sales, because nobody's seen it. People only see the one that's already got sales, so it gets more sales, and then it gets shown above other books, and it gets more sales, and so on and so forth. Which is why it's important to build up a kind of overtime followers. Like your first couple of books will sell a couple of copies, and but the next time you release a book, those people who bought those copies and enjoyed it will buy that next book, and that's already giving it a bump in the algorithm more than it would have had because it'll have a higher initial rank at launch. Yeah. Um, more people will see it because it's gone straight up and then more people will buy it. So you might sell, say, five copies of your first book and then your second book. Literally that people. few. That few. Oh, literally the, five, the, not the 500, average, five. <laughs> the, the av- yeah, the, the average sales for an author um, is like less than 10 copies. Wow. That, that's wow. not just in kind of our sphere where we're you know publishing ourselves and doing all the audiobooks. Even in big publishing houses, the average number of copies sold is very low. Right. Very, okay. very low. And it's because it's a it's a big market, right? You could go on Amazon and look on how many new books are released a day and it's thousands and thousands and thousands, isn't it? It's Yeah. Well it's every, like, every day when I look at books to audition for uh, if I've got time to audition, because sometimes I think I get to the end of the day and I think, oh my, oh, no, because I, because I work with authors who do. That was one thing I had to learn about audiobooks. Hardly anybody writes one book, so if no, I get to narrate yeah. their book, they usually come back for more, like you did. This oh, is yeah, number five, yeah, yeah, because they like what you do. So and so in the end, you're doing fewer of your auditions. But when I do go and look for auditions on ACX, there's always like, it's like a couple of hundred every day show up. I mean, it's a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you know they don't. They're not all going to sell. It's, they can't all yeah, sell. Yeah. It's it. It is. It's it is all down to like when I, when I first started for my first my first book, which was a short story collection of horror stories, and it was under a different pen name. Um, sold like ten copies. Wow. Total. Wow. Yeah, and this um, is what like a year's work, <laughs> or your uh, life's well, work, if that's that's the one at, that's been at, your first book. At that time. It, it was about six months work and it was a very short book. It's just 12 short stories. Um, so it was half the size of like one of the novels that I put out now. Mm-hmm. And next, it sold like 10 or so copies. Mm-hmm. But then the next book I put out, which was a, a horror novel, sold 15 copies because half of those people liked the book and they bought that next one. But mm-hmm. then because the next book I put, put out you know, say 10 of those people like that book enough to buy the next book, then you're talking where you sold 20 copies and it snowballs like that over time. It's not a, it's not something you can turn around and do instantly. You, you always see a lot of like news articles, for example, of like, you know, debut author sells 20 million copies and they win this and that award and stuff like that. And the the answer is it's never true. It's no, no author. So the truth is no author putting out a book, very rarely is it their actual first book they've ever written. Every author is a drawer of books that they've written. So this J.K. Rowling story, that she was a, she, she'd written lots of books before the Harry Potter series then, yeah. It's just that they yeah. were the ones that, that hit, yeah. They were the ones that she could sell to a publisher. Yeah. 
probably in a probably half the what are they call the the novels she brings out now with their crime stories. They've probably been sat in a drawer for years before that, or at least the ideas or the foundations of them. You know, yeah, yeah. Even yeah. even then, like the, the publishing houses love to sell this idea of a debut author author's gone big. Like Harry Potter is a great example. The story for Harry Potter is that oh nobody wanted to know about it and she got it on the last one and that's that's just flat not true like it, no it's it is it is there is there's there are multiple records from publishing companies saying no no we offered it there was a bidding war for the book you know there were multiple publishing companies that wanted to take it on so but they love to sell this idea it's part of it's part of the, i don't begrudge them it it's part of the marketing of publishing isn't it mm-hmm. yeah. the idea that when you're if you're a publishing house you want people to be submitting their books to you so you can pick the ones that you think are going to sell and send them out. And when you're giving out this message, oh yeah, we picked up this debut author and we sold a million copies, you're going to get more submissions, aren't you? <laughs> That's just of course, it's just good business gonna, to say gonna that. Be, I'm going to be next, yeah. And it, it's it's the thing you've got to remember with. I mean, I've never been shy about it. The name you can see here is is a pen name, right? Mm-hmm. It, yeah. I I spent kind of two years or so doing um, horror and science fiction under a different pen name. Um, We've talked about it before, and this this came about the Tracy Gregory name from a contest originally, and that book in that contest did quite well considering the contest. It it wasn't wasn't gobbling some of the sales or anything, but it sold a couple hundred copies, and that's because I was able to take what I'd learned beforehand and use that to an advantage. Like a mm. good example, I was the only person in that contest who had an audio book done, <laughs> knowing that audio books sell normal book copies because sometimes people like both. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. They do, and especially like when you can have it synced up, can't you, on Amazon? And Whisper, and whis- what's it called? Whisper something or other. It's Whisper something. Sync, I think. Whisper yeah. Sync, it's co- yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, I was able to then, because that book did quite well, leverage that to make the next books bigger successes. Um, I mean, like the first book that did quite well out of that competition, I put out seven sequels to it. Wow! <laughs> um, wow. Yeah. But each of those is it's just another like foundational stepping stone, yeah, isn't it? It's um, unfortunately, is case in writing is we'd love the idea it to be the case. It's what everyone thinks it is, and it's not that you can make a piece of art and it's a brilliant piece of art, and people will see it and instantly recognize it, and everybody wants it, and they buy it, and you become a millionaire overnight, and you go yeah. live on your your yacht, you know, in Magaluf or whatever, yeah. and it's not how it works it's you've got to build it up over time it's the same as any business the overnight successes are the tiny minority yeah and even then you don't know the backstory i mean if you look at like the biggest thing that happened in music in the 20th century which was the beatles you know Mm -hmm. they love this story that they were playing in the cavern and brian epstein came in one night to see them and he signed them and then that was it whatever they'd already had five years of slogging it out in dives and three years in hamburg and wait working eight hours a night you know they don't they'd recorded in hamburg and it did nothing and you know and even and they'd been turned they then they got after epstein they they kept slogging away he was going down to the train on the train to london every day and decker turned them down every label turned them down and then eventually they got their break and when they did they were ready um, yeah. If they'd have got their break two or three years earlier, they probably wouldn't have been ready and they would have just been a couple of, you know, a one hit wonder if it was even a hit and disappeared again. But because they could keep coming up with the goods because they'd been, because they'd they got into this. Doing it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's not so... the story that likes to be told in America. They were told they just kind of showed up on the Ed Sullivan show in 64, you know? Just magic. Yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. Uh, people. I get the idea. It's the the romanticism of it, isn't it? It's a romanticism sure. of oh, somebody spend their life. One thing people love is they love to equate the length of time it took to write a novel with how good it is, which is not okay. true at all. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, as soon as, as soon as people find out that you're an author, they love to tell you about the book that they've been writing and will definitely finish it one day. It's taken them fifteen years so far, but they'll do it. And the answer is, if it's taken you 15 years, you're probably never going to finish that. <laughs> I forget what whose quote it was, and I might have mentioned it to you before because I love it. Somebody once said, those who write are writers, and those who wait are waiters. <laughs> and I kind of like that, you know? They, they, you know, they're not, they're not physically, they're not waiting, but they're doing something else because they're not writing. You either yeah. do it or you don't, yeah. 
and you got to get yeah, on with it. It's, it's so there the, isn't a, there isn't a secret, I don't know, a Facebook thing that you get on or go no, on there. No, or what? It's the, just because you've it's it's gained the momentum and it's at a point yeah, now where it's accepted. Ad- advertising can help because advertising is an accelerant to momentum, isn't it? And you do know? you do anything like that? I, I for, do. For, I do run yeah. my kind of Facebook adverts and stuff. Right. I don't spend a, I don't spend a massive amount of money on it or anything like that. Unfortunately, some people do. It's a very easy trap to fall into where they release a book and they don't get very many sales. And so their solution is to pour a lot of money into advertising. And all that means is they spend a lot of money on advertising for right. <laughs> no return at all. Because it's it's that, um, oh, what's the term for it? Uh, like a sunk cost, isn't it? They, the they, sunk they cost think, fallacy. Yeah, yeah. yeah they think, yeah. well, I've put 100 quid into Amazon ads. Well, I got to keep spending now. Otherwise, I'm not going to get my money back. And say, like, no, it's clearly not. It's like not a gambler really. chasing the win, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah. There's, there's no point advertising something that isn't selling on its own. Yeah. Um, when, when you release a book, Amazon does most of the advertising for you initially in the first couple of days because if you ever go on to Amazon, you look for a book, you've always got the newest releases. Yeah. You know, it's always these are the books that have just come out. And that's kind of the strongest push you can get because the first set of books will always be, it's always a, you get like a peak and then it will slide off over time and then you get a sequel come out and then the first book will get a peak because people Yeah, it that. definitely happens with Goblin Summoners. I mean, uh, book one sold, you know, sold really well. Then when book two came out, book two starts selling, book one starts selling again. Oh, and then the yes. se- second when the third one came out, one and two start selling again, you know? And every time you put an extra one on the series, the previous ones start selling again. I mean, they're selling, but the amount they sell per week goes up i've noticed yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It definitely happens. and it's it's uh it's a case of that's kind of it's kind of again it's all self-reinforcing if you've got a new book that comes out that sells all your previous books because all your previous books sold they get promoted to customers more and like i release this book now and then probably everybody who follows me as an, Am- an author on amazon will get an email from amazon saying oh there's a new book that's come out from them or a new audio book you know, and yeah, again, you can amplify that by paying ads, but if you're not getting sales to begin with, yeah, it's, there's, it's nothing there's nothing much yeah. to amplify. There's nothing to amplify. Yeah. <laughs> you can say, all right, you can spend a hundred pounds on Facebook advertising a month and it'll amplify your sales a hundred percent. But if your monthly sales is one, <laughs> it's a waste of time, <laughs> isn't it? It's not, it's, it's not worth it. Yeah. So I think it's a very long roundabout way of saying what is the secret and it's just perseverance <laughs> okay yeah well that's good work. to know for anyone who's wondering you know who's who's an author who's watching this and has and has put a book out and, and is wondering what the deal is to get the sales into the thousands and thousands which the goblin summoner the, series is now the, 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 uh, and, and thank I, you for that because of the royalties by the way yeah lovely well, I, yeah. I spend a lot of time talking to other authors and a lot of the authors i talk to are very successful and any of them will tell you the same thing the, the best advertisement for your book is the next book right yeah so that that's the ultimate truth it's always the next book is always the thing that will help the other books just you've got to keep doing it keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it well thank you for letting me be part of it and and basically stealing your work and reading your words out loud because that's all i do it's not but, stealing, uh, I don't think. That's not a... uh, but, uh, but it is so much fun because you do write some great characters, which really challenges me to get the, oh, there's a new character. Okay, I need a voice for this one. Oh, <laughs> oh I know, I'll make him Scouse or whatever it is I decide. And then I get really into the character and, what, and, and it, 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 they're so much fun to do. They really are great. The, the Goblin Summoner series, there is a new one. It's called Wake the Dead. In fact, you can, if you listen to the audiobook or you read the the print version or the uh, the Kindle version of Wake the Dead. You don't need to have read the other four Goblin Summoner books. It works as a standalone. In fact, I think any one of the Goblin Summoner books would work as a standalone. And that might be another reason. Maybe somebody discovers the series halfway in and then decides to go back to the beginning. Yeah, I don't know. Happens, that that yeah. might be going on. But it is, it's a terrific read. And trust me, because I've read it, but I think it's a pretty good listen as well. And, and I hope you enjoy it. If you'd like to buy a copy to download it of of any of the Goblin Summoner books, including the latest one, uh, Wake the Dead. I've got links for you in the description to all of the Goblin Summoner series, and it links you straight through to Amazon, and you can get them from there. And uh, I've got a, a full disclosure, I've got an Amazon affiliate 
thing going now so i get a i get a piece of that as well not a lot but i do all right on that too so if you'd like to get them if there's links in the description there for you so you can get any of the goblin the uh, the goblin summon up books that you want what is next for tracy gregory uh well like i mentioned so the, the next goblin summoner book uh will be out in the next few weeks mm-hmm. um so be that uh after that i'm not entirely sure i think i'll write It'll be a book in one of the other series because at this point, including Wait the Dead, I'll have written three Goblin Summoner books back to back. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, I te- yeah. I tend to try and do got a Goblin Summoner book and then a book in one of my other series and try and alternate it. But because this this is the book that kind of fell into the slot of one of the alternates, <laughs> it means yeah, I've yeah. potentially written three back to back. Um yeah. So it'll be something else in one of the other series. Like Star Commander, uh, one of those. Because I should mention as well, we haven't just done the five Goblin Summoner books. We've done other, we've done other uh, lit uh, uh, RPG books. We've done a science fiction one, which is a lot of fun as well. So yeah, uh, in fact, I'll put links to all of the. I'll put links to all of the Tracy Gregory audio books that I've done in the description. So you can take your pick from there because there's some good stuff in there. And you, so you might be going back to one of those or a different series. Uh, no, it'll be one of those. It'll be yeah. a, a continuation. It'll probably either be a continuation to We The People or... Yes, or oh, We The People was great, yeah. Uh, yeah. Or, um, or Level, Level Up Kaiju? Up. Yeah, one, one of those two, probably. Um, Not Star ones, Commander. We've done three of Star Commander. Yeah, the others need to catch up, I think. Yeah, they need to catch up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. yeah. There there will be more, but they need to kind of follow along a bit. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a pleasure working with you. Thanks once again for choosing me as your narrator. The latest book from Tracy Gregory is called Wake the Dead. It's kind of a spin-off from the Goblin Summoner series, but you don't have to be familiar with the series to enjoy it. Tracy Gregory, thank you so much. Thank you, Graham.